So we're back in the boardroom today. We are going to have a visual explanation on the different styles of listing, whether it be long tail or quick flip items. We're going to break those down with actual numbers to show you how it all works. Before we hop over there, though, I just wanted to shout out that the two most important aspects of selling anything are flipping something technically as quick as possible and for the lowest amount of cost. So if you keep your costs down and you can flip the items quickly, you'll do the best. Now, flipping something quickly doesn't mean that you may hold on to it for a year or two. That may be quick for those items. It just depends on what you have into it. So if you have no cost into something, the quickness or the time factor isn't a consideration. So let's hop over there now and show you what we're talking about. So let's take this shirt, for example, here. Let's say we paid $5 for this shirt. In five days, in the same week we put it up, we sold it for 25 bucks. So we've got a $25 gross return on the item as of right this second. Now, once we take out the COGS, cost of goods, $5, it drops it down to $20. It's going to cost us, let's just say, $5 to ship. That'll cover the little fees and whatever else we have in the shipping. So that brings it down to $15. We also have a 10% eBay final value fee on it. So that brings it down to $12.50. That's what our return is, our profit before taxes, the bottom line net basically on that. So that's the number we're working with here on a quick flip. We just made $12.50 and we didn't have to hold on to a single thing to do that. The money was back right away and we can spend the original $5 and then the profit right away. Before any statements do or anything's popped up, we have the money back. We can go out and spend it and we also have another $12.50 we can use to do something else with as well. So we're all set on that. That is what many people do. That is the biggest way that people will move items on eBay. Quick flips is always the best. It's not always possible. Depending on your area, depending on what you have to do, that model may or may not work for you. Now, something to consider in that example, you may have been able to price it higher and held on to it for a longer period of time, but recouped a bigger profit. So let's say you held on to it for two months, incurred another 10 cents or even say 40 cents, depending on what store level you have and what your fees are, but you sold it for $50. You would have come out far better by selling it later on for a higher price than you would have just blowing it out for $25. But you may have needed that money and had to have blown it out. So it really comes down to financial standpoint. Can you afford to do that? Is it gonna work for your business model? Do you have to have that money back right away? Now you could have used a $50 purchase or a $500 purchase. The example is basically the same amount, just a different percentage of profit. If you sunk in $500, most people are going to want to do it this way and sell it quicker for maybe a less amount of money. That is something that you may have to do. So no drawback or criticism for using that model in general. So now let's look at the long tail model. We bought these books over here, 50 of them for $500, $10 a book. Let's go look at the math on this one as well and the time frames it will take to get that $500 back and turn a profit. So obviously this is a much different example. We have 50 items that we have 10 bucks a piece into for a total of $500 invested in this. Now this is something you're not gonna be able to sell all at once real quick unless there's something really rare or something that's just so sought after. I usually will do so much better as well selling them individually than opposed to selling them and blowing them out in a big lot. So those are some considerations. Again, $500 invested into this. So let's break this down into a monthly basis instead of weekly. We're going to be holding on to these items for a little bit of time. So let's say in the first month, I sold six of these for a total of $210, roughly 35 bucks a book. Now we're going to have our eBay fee, of course, $21 into that. We're also going to have shipping into this. On average, let's just say we spend $4 a book to mail these out for a total of $24. So let's say we brought in, at the end of the day, before taxes, of course, $165. So at the end of month one, we still have $335 that we have to pay back just to break even on this. So now we're going to look at the second month. The second month in, we sold four items 
$140 we took in, now minus the final value fee and shipping and the whole works, it's going to bring us down to $110. Now, I'm not counting the listing fee in here, just in case anybody's wondering. We get 10,000 free listings. I'm just assuming it's in there. You're talking pennies to list this for another month, at the very most, 35 cents. So that's just a drop in the bucket. I'm not going to worry about that. It's easier to explain the math if we do it this way for you. There's no oddball numbers. We're working with solid figures here. So now at the end of month two, we've brought in another $110, and that brings us down to $225 still that we need to pay back. So let's say in month number three, we also sell four more items. Four more books were sold. Again, at the end of the day, we've brought down another $110 in. So that brings us now down to $115. So we can keep this up. Now we go up to month number four. We sell another four, another $110. That brings us now down to $5 balance. So now in the fifth month, we only have five bucks invested in this. We have 32 books left. We sell one more. We've paid it off and made a small profit off of this. We still have 31 more books. And if we sell those for 35 bucks a piece, we're going to make over $1,000 for that $500 investment. So a $1,000 profit for a $500 investment spread over the time of five, six, seven, eight months is not a problem to me. Now, for some people, they would have put that in a lot, taken that $500 investment, listed it, say, for eight or $900 and made a quick $300 off of it. They wouldn't have been out the money and they could have probably sold it right of way. So they wouldn't have that risk involved of hanging on to stuff for length of time. Now, one other thing to consider, let's say you invest $500 in week one, $500 in week two, $500 in week three, and $500 in week four. You've now invested $2,000 in a month into items. Now, if those are all long tail, you may not get any of that money back to recoup that expense for months. So you have to be able to afford to sink that kind of money into something. And this could go on month after month after month. I know obviously you're going to be selling other things, so you may have money coming in. But if you can't afford to float that kind of money, this model won't work for you. That's the biggest consideration. Bottom end is, though, if you can afford to do this, this is the way you can get so much more profit. If you're selling things at a quick flip for $300 at a pop, as opposed to $1,000, just by holding on to something, you can make $700 more with that initial purchase. You have to know a little bit about what you're doing. Obviously, the money has to be there in your account to be able to do this. But for us, this would be the far better model because we make more money doing it this way, a considerable amount more as opposed to it. So basically, on a quick flip on those same 50 books, you may only make... $300 just to blow them out to get some good money coming in. $300 is still a good profit, but you invested 500. So it's a big chunk of change not to get more money out of it than that in my book. We hold on to it though as a long tail item and take six, seven, eight months to sell them. We could turn around and get a thousand dollars back. That's my take on it. It just depends on, again, your financial business, where you stand financially, whether you can afford to do that or not. The better picture, though, is to bring more to the bottom line, even if it takes you longer. It's a considerable difference in price. But that's the math for today. Well, there we are. Hopefully that gave you some real good, honest thought, a real good breakdown with actual information used from things that we have bought. So I just wanted to give you a look into that, something to think about. It all, again, comes down to whether you can afford to let something set versus you have to flip it. Those are the big key things in this. Many people will have to flip something right away to keep that revenue coming in. So they'll pay off the item and they'll have more money to go out and buy something else to keep flipping and flipping and flipping and flipping. At some point, you'll be able to hop on larger lots because you'll have more money coming in. It takes time. It took us years, three plus years to be at a point where the money wasn't as much of an issue and we could let stuff sit for a very long time if that meant we could get a lot more money out of it and increase the profits from that initial investment. But that's what I have for you today. Hopefully that gave you some ideas and some thoughts. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that like button down below. You can also hit the bell icon to be notified if I post new content or go live, subscribe and tell a friend.
expenses. They're the only ones that you can control. They're your baby. Just mine? Just one guy's? The two main responsibilities of all the one guys in this store are fast turnover and control of variable expenses. Move the merchandise at the lowest cost. Now, the big question is, Mr. Store Manager, what can you do about it? 